morning. That automated announcement is so effective at getting people into their seats and so nice to see all of you. I'll need the clicker. Welcome to Natural Products Expo West. This is our 39th annual and I'm really glad to be here. I'm Carlotta Mast. I'm the market leader and senior vice president of content and insights at New Hope. New Hope is a company that puts on um, Natural Products Expo West and creates a lot of the research that goes into this annual state of the industry presentation. I've been doing this presentation now for five or six years and every year I feel like we have an even stronger story to tell in terms of the state of the industry, the impact of the industry, and I was here all day yesterday for our Climate Day education, our business school education, um, our Hemp and CBD Summit. How many of you were here for any of that education? So some of you. Well, if you were here, you know that when I was thinking about a word that really sums up our industry right now, for me that word is engaged. Yesterday whether it was all of the leaders, the pioneers of this industry at Climate Day who are taking real climate action in their companies and helping our industry have a positive impact in this huge challenge of global warming, or whether it was the hundreds of people who are attending Natural Products Business School. Um, here at Expo West for the first time, everyone was so engaged. They're here to launch and grow their businesses. They're here to have an impact on the world. So when I think of the state of our industry, it's absolutely a state of engagement and power. And you know, so this session is, is filled with information and I hope also a little inspiration. And over the 90 minutes, we're going to hopefully help prepare you for an even more successful Expo West. I'm going to talk about some of the um, sales and growth in the industry that we saw last year by product category and sales channel and also discuss some of the top macro forces and related trends that are really shaping the future of this industry. And I'm, I'm very thrilled to have joining me this year Nick McCoy, who is the co-founder and managing director of Whipstitch Capital. And he's been a great partner to New Hope over the years. And we started talking about the data, and it was so clear that he needed to come here and share the state of the industry stage with me to you know, provide more of a, a, a deeper dive into the data and market insights um, that his team has access to in partnership with, with SPINS. And so he's going to talk you know, at a deeper level about what's happening from a sales and growth perspective in natural and organic and how, in particular, the investment community is thinking about that and how brands and retailers should be thinking about that. We're then going to turn our attention to the future of the industry with a panel discussion. And we've got an industry pioneer, a master industry collaborator, an entrepreneurial rising star and nutrition maven, and an agricultural visionary and change maker joining that discussion. And so again, the goal is to set you up with the data and insights and inspiration you need to have um, the best Expo West possible and to really guide your journey over the next couple of days as you walk the show floor and meet people and, you know, and, and go out from Expo West and continue growing your business. And you know, we have an amazing Expo West planned for you. This is our 39th annual Expo West. We're expecting an es estimated 88,000 attendees. So there'll be a few of you here in Anaheim this week. We have more than 3,600 exhibitors. And this year, of those 3,600 exhibitors, 700 are first-time exhibitors. So many, many new companies with very innovative products and business models for you to discover. We also have more than 700 international exhibitors. So this is a very global community. And you'll have 587,000 square feet of ex exhibition space to explore over the next four days. So I hope everyone is equipped with really comfortable walking shoes and a reusable water bottle. We've got um, water bottle filling stations in the convention center now so you can stay hydrated. And we're just you know, hoping you have a wonderful Expo West. One thing I also wanted to mention is when you're on the show floor, be sure to keep an eye out for the 
Step Up to Organic campaign. This is a new campaign that we have launched at New Hope in um, cooperation and partnership with the organic industry to really feature all of the amazing innovation that is happening with certified organic products. We're live streaming this session, so whether you're here in Anaheim or at home, we invite you to share your thoughts about what's happening in the industry on social using the hashtags Expo West and Expo West Trends. And if you want to share anything pertaining to organic, which I hope you do, please use the Step Up to Organic hashtag so we can help spread the love for organic at Expo and beyond. And speaking of social, we have more than 500 social influencers at this year's Expo West, including our Fab Five influencer team, who will all be using their mega social influence to share their favorite Expo products and trends, and also advocate for important issues like organic and world-changing women. We have many world-changing women in this community, and the plant revolution that is really shaping our industry. But I know so many of you are here for the numbers, so let's dig in. The numbers look really good for the US natural and organic industry. And the industry as a whole, which includes natural and organic um, and functional foods and beverages, dietary supplements, and natural living, grew almost 7% last year to reach $219 billion in consumer sales, according to our Nutrition Business Journal estimates. And sales growth was up slightly last year, and the industry is on track to surpass $250 billion in sales by 2021. And when I started in this industry, we were well under $100 billion, so this industry is growing rapidly. Now, food and beverage remains the largest category by far for the total industry, with natural, organic, and functional foods and beverages um, making up 70% of total industry sales last year. And I see some people taking pictures and taking notes. That's fine. We're, we will also be um, distributing all of the slides to everyone who had their badge scanned um, at the door, so you'll be getting all of this information after Expo. So let's look at total food and beverage. Natural and organic and functional food and beverage sales grew 6.6% .6 to $152 billion last year. And now Expo West is very much a packaged food show, but produce, fresh fruits and vegetables still maintain the largest share of sales in food and beverage in our industry with an estimated $22.2 billion in sales last year. The category that saw the strongest growth was actually meat, fish, and poultry, as consumers increasingly seek out responsible and cleaner options in this category. We're also seeing that this snackification trend, this convenience trend, continues to drive expansion in better for you and functional snacks, and you'll see a lot of those products at the show. Now, looking just at organic, when we break out organic, this is now organic food and beverages, a $45 billion category in the US, with sales growing 5.6% last year. Organic is absolutely mainstream now, and with volume and size has come a slight slowing of growth for the organic food and beverage category. Some of this is due to some of the struggles in organic dairy, which makes up 14% of the category. And last year, the organic dairy category continued to see growth plateauing due to an oversupply and, of course, growing consumer preference for plant-based alternatives to the dairy category. Um, in, this, in organic food and beverage, organic produce drives 38% of sales. And we continue to see in organic produce and also other organic in, in, ingredients, organic supply lagging behind growing consumer demand. And so that's a challenge that the industry continues to need to address. Functional foods and beverages. Now, these are those products that, that provide some kind of a functional benefit with an added functional ingredient, whether that's an inherently functional ingredient or more of a processed functional ingredient. In this category, 2018 was an amazing year for this category. And you know, a lot of this is being driven by that food is medicine trend as consumers opt for foods and beverages that provide real health benefits and functionality. This category grew 7.5% to $68 billion last year, and so that was almost a full percentage over the growth we saw in 2017. 
the highest growth subcategories within functional beverages and functional, um, within functional foods and beverages are the beverages category and then functional snacks. And popular ingredients that are being incorporated into these beverages and snacks and other functional products include mushrooms, ashwagandha, pre and probiotics, and of course, hemp and CBD. And the growth in probiotic foods and beverages is, is one area where this represents the continued blurring of the line between dietary supplements and foods and beverages as consumers um, have a, show a growing preference for non-pill and non-capsule delivery forms for functional products. Now, when we look at natural, organic, and functional food and beverage sales compared to conventional, um, food and beverage sales. You know, it's not new news that natural, organic, and functional is, is growing at a far faster pace, pace than conventional food and beverage. And that category actually began to shrink last year, conventional food and beverage. And this is evidenced by, you know, the billions of dollars that companies like Kraft Heinz reported losing um, in the last quarter of last year. And, you know, Last year, conventional food and beverage sales totaled $634 billion, but the, gross, the growth was negative 2.2%. Um, and Nick's going to talk more about what this means for the long-term view of food and beverage. So let's look at supplements. Supplements are a really important category for this industry, and last year was a good year for dietary supplements, with growth up 6.1% to $46 billion, according to our NBJ estimates. Um, collagen, adaptogenic herbs, mushrooms, prebiotics, and of course CBD and hemp are all ingredients that are helping to propel growth in the dietary supplement category. Now, the subcategory of herbs and botanicals, which makes up 19% of total supplement sales, that continued to be a really bright spot for the industry last year, with year-over-year -year growth um, surpassing even our forecasted um, estimates that we had last year. So it continues to be an amazing growth category for supplements. And within herbs and botanicals, we also saw a lot of um, growth in specifically immune support supplements last year, which isn't surprising given all the media attention paid to the cold and flu season. And even in a category like, a stalwart category like multivitamins, which is the largest single supplement category, that category was even up slightly last year. And if you'd like to know more about what's happening in the supplement industry from a sales and growth and trend perspective, we have our supplement roundtable, which happens right after this session in Orange County Ballroom One. And my colleague, Claire Morton, from the NBJ team is going to be sharing a lot more NBJ data. Looking at natural living, which includes personal care, household, and pet products, that's now a $20 billion category, with sales growing 6.5% last year, a strong year again for growth in this category. And some highlights from natural living, household cleaners saw double digit growth last year. We also saw really strong growth in organic oral care and feminine care. And sales growth in these self care categories, the bath salts, the face masks, which you now see across retail, these were also strong in helping to propel growth in this overall category as consumers embrace clean beauty and personal care and are really paying more attention to not only what they put in their bodies, but what they put on their bodies and bring into their homes. Now within natural living and really for the entire industry, the category that continues to really shine is pet products, natural and organic pet products. And again, this category outperformed all others in 2018. Sales growth for the full category was up 10.2% to $7 billion, and growth in natural and organic far outpaced the 1.9% growth achieved by the $26 billion conventional pet products market. Millennials are driving a lot of the growth in natural and organic pet, and um, we found a statistic that 73% of millennials currently own a pet. That's amazing. 73% of millennials own a pet, according to the American Pet Products Association. And another study found that 86% of millennials believe that natural and better for your pet food is really vital for the health of their pet. 
And the growing interest in this category is fueling a lot of attractive um, acquisition targets, as, was, as we saw last year with the $8 billion acquisition of Blue Buffalo by General Mills. Now, looking at sales um, for the full industry by channel, this industry continues to be a brick and mortar channel with 86% of sales being rung up either in the mass market or the natural channel. 60% of total sales are happening in the mass channel and the mass channel grew 7.4% to about $130 billion last year. The natural channel which helped to create this industry and continues to be a vitally important channel for the industry grew at a slower rate of 3.3% to reach about $58 billion in sales. And although natural is now significantly smaller than the mass market channel, um, Nick is going to share some really interesting data that shows how strategically important the natural channel is for this industry, particularly some of those new brands. And E-commerce is getting a ton of attention, and there is unbelievable growth in the e-commerce channel for the natural and organic industry. That channel grew 18% last year to reach $8.4 billion. And while the e-commerce channel is still driving you know, less than 5% of total industry sales, that will change um, pretty quickly over time. And we're seeing that this channel is becoming increasingly important to the industry particularly as a launch pad for new brands and products. Last year, we conducted a survey of 300 natural and organic brands, and we found that nearly half of all new companies that entered the market between 2015 and 2018 started selling online before they ever moved into any kind of retail distribution. And you know that's a huge shift for our industry. And if you'd like to know more about what's happening in e-commerce and with omni-channel sales and how to have a true omni-channel approach for your brand, I would encourage you to check out our Fueling Sales in an Omni-Channel World session, um, which takes place 10 to 12.30 on Friday. Now, along with Omni-Channel, another mega trend, as I've mentioned, of course, is hemp and CBD. And I wanted to share just a little bit of the new data that we have at New Hope and through our Nutrition Business Journal business related to hemp and CBD. Because, of course, passage of the 2018 Farm Bill, as well as skyrocketing consumer curiosity, is really luring many brands and, and consumers to this space, as our re research is showing. So when we look at it from a sales perspective, looking at just hemp-based CBD supplements, and supplements is by far the largest product category for CBD products right now, um, NBJ estimates, estimates that sales of these supplement products grew 60% last year to reach about $238 billion. And, and sales growth is expected to remain high over the next several years, remain, you know, barring any major regulatory roadblocks. We wanted to better understand, well, how are consumers thinking about this, this category? Because there's all these brands coming in, and so what are consumers thinking? So we surveyed more than 2,700 consumers that represent the general population in the US. And we found from this work that 40%, 47% of consumers have some level of famil familiarity with CBD. So they've, they have, they've heard of it. You know, 16% had heard of it, of that 47%. but. Um, didn't quite know what it was, and 30% of the consumers we surveyed weren't familiar at all. And of those consumers that had heard of CBD and were familiar at some level, 57% have considered purchasing a CBD product, 47% have actually researched CBD to try to understand the benefits and why they might want to invest in a product, and 30% had actually purchased a CBD product. We're excited to continue this research to see how consumer um, understanding shifts over the short term. We also wanted to understand, okay, so what are brands thinking? So we surveyed 230 natural and organic brands in January of this year and found that most are not currently selling any hemp or CBD products. And the ones that are, the majority have actually launched companies specifically to sell in the hemp and CBD space. 
But that is expected to change, as you can see from this last pie chart, because 65% of the companies we surveyed said they expect to add a hemp or CBD product to their offerings within the next one to two years. So this shows that a lot of the, the more legacy companies in the industry are planning to move into this space and, and there is likely to be much, much more activity. And so that really makes this hemp opportunity one of those macro forces that has the, uh, the ability to significantly impact our industry in both the short and long term. So speaking of macro forces, I wanted to use my last few minutes to highlight a few additional macro forces and related trends that are also having a profound impact on the industry and something that we're watching closely at New Hope. We pay attention to those macro trends that cut across all categories and that have staying power to actually shape the industry. We're not talking about um, micro trend fads or things that pop up here and there. We're really talking about these big shifts that are shaping who we are and what we sell and how consumers are driving what's happening in our industry. And so the first macro force I wanted to talk about is plant wisdom because I think we all know this is one of the most powerful macro forces in our industry today as consumers are waking up to the social, environmental, and health benefits of plant-based foods. And natural and organic brands are, are meeting this growing interest with innovative products that make it easier, healthier, and more delicious than ever to ditch traditional meat and dairy, even if it's only temporarily. Um, I'm particularly interested in the organic brands that are popping up around this macro force. We've got Moolala, who has a new organic oat milk, which is such a, an increasingly popular category. You've got Legrand in the sauces and soup space. We're also seeing a growing variety of plants being used to create delicious dairy alternatives, including peely nuts, which are found in Lava's new low-sugar plant-based yogurt, and also seeing hemp come up into products. You know, Elmhurst Milk has a new hemp creamer. The world is fat is, is a macro force that really um, shows how brands are responding in creative ways to changing consumer perceptions around nutrition, including the growing appreciation for healthy fats and understanding that sugar isn't all that sweet when it comes to health and weight management. So walking the show floor, you'll see lots of brands that are aligned with this macro force, you know, by providing more keto-friendly offerings such as Kiss My Keto. You'll also see brands like Mount Mayan that are making it easy to eat a range of healthy fats from omega-3s to omega-9s. You'll also encounter brands that have significantly lowered or eliminated added sugar in their products, such as Numa in the sports drink category, and True Made Foods and condiments. Amidst the pressures of modern life, consumers are seeking out diets to help stave off and prevent disease, treat conditions, and perhaps most important, optimize how they feel today and every day. And this aligns with our life of vitality macro force. This is leading to many opportunities for innovative products that support a healthy microbiome, like Gutsy's new prebiotic fruit pods, and that make it easy to follow a keto or paleo diet. And this macro force is also paving the way for all of that growing consumer interest in products that support the endocannabinoid system, including the many hemp and CBD products you'll run into on the show floor. Two products that have really stood out to me in this area are Winged, which is a new hemp CBD line for women, and RE Botanicals, which is blazing trails in organic certified hemp. The modern pantry trend is all about the fact that today's pantry looks very different than perhaps the pantries that our parents had. And these modern pantries are designed to connect with more diverse consumers, have real stories behind the products found on the shelves in that pantry, and are meeting a changing array of needs and desires and beliefs on the consumer front. And this modern pantry macro, macro force is creating opportunities for brands to update stale categories as this bone broth um, barbecue sauce from Noble Maid is doing in the condiment category. It's ensuring that convenience is always met with real nutrition and great taste as skinny souping is doing for the soup category. It's creating more permissible indulgences through the incorporation of more veggies and less sugar as Peekaboo is doing with the hidden veggies found in its ice cream treats. And it's allowing brands to connect with re consumers by reinforcing their brand values in everything they 
they do. And Vital Farms is an amazing example of a brand that does this throughout their expanding product line. The power of science macro force is this macro force that is fueling exciting um, innovation within the food and CPG industry and allowing brands to connect with consumers who are looking for science-based products and values-driven innovation that has the potential to change the world for the better. And so we're seeing science and technology improve nearly every category in our industry, including home care. Counterculture has a new probiotic line, um, probiotic-based cleaner line that uses good bacteria to break down um, dirt and grease and odors and be an effective home cleaner using probiotics. Um, in the personal care category, we're seeing companies like Customized Organic with their new line of hair care products that are personalized specifically to a person's unique needs based on the information they collect about that person's hair and their lifestyle. And we're also seeing so much innovation in food and nutrition, innovation that is more um, nature-like with sensible foods. Um, uh, technology, that's a good example. So they have a technology that, that allows them to dry their fruits in a way that retains more nutritional value. We're also seeing cellular agriculture and other food technologies that are promising to bring um, even bigger innovations to the market like animal-free milk, which Perfect Day is working on. We, of course, are seeing lots happening on the materials front, and this is, this is addressing some of our challenges in packaging and, 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 and ingredient waste. And so we're seeing brands take a creative approach to incorporating reduce, reuse, and recycle principles into their products and packaging. And this is resulting in reusable packaging from brands such as Wildscape and Pathwater. We're seeing so much more compostable packaging from brands like Loving Earth, and alter eco, and the use of more efficient materials like bamboo, which is used to make these new bad, bad bandages from patch. And we're going to talk a lot more about our packaging opportunities when we get to our panel conversation. The last macro force I wanted to talk about is one that really gets to the inventive business models that are transforming this industry. And they speak to the greater purpose that many companies are building into their brands, into their partnerships, into their ownership and funding models, and into their sourcing practices. And this is leading to mission-driven brands like Pete and Jerry's and their ability to really expand organic acreage. And it's leading to brands like Maple Hill engaging in and investing in things like the new regenerative organic certification. It's, investing, it's enabling brands like Hands on Herbs to use things like hand harvesting and other responsible sourcing practices as they scale their brands. And it's, it's allowing brands like Applegate to use radical collaboration um, to, to launch an entirely regenerative skew of products under this new food collective sub-brand. And it's this, this um, opportunity that collaboration is enabling for the industry that we're going to talk a lot about in our panel discussion. And with that, um, I want to thank you again for being here, and I'd like to pass the mic over to Nick to tell us more about what's happening from a sales and growth standpoint. Thank you, Carlotta. Thank you, Carlotta, and uh, thank you to New Hope for all you do for this event and the industry. It's, it's, it's really, really a backbone. I won't read the disclaimer. <clears throat> um, so first off, just thinking about all of the trends that Carlotta had, and there was a lot of information there. Um, she and I have been chatting, and, and I thought it would be nice to dig in a little bit and just look at kind of what's behind the numbers and see some of the surprises and some of the insights that you can pull out of that. Um, so the first thing was just kind of taking a look at the decline in conventional, or where, to, where or I should say where conventional products are declining, and look at that by category. And I, I don't think there's a lot of surprise here. I mean, there's a lot of dietary trends out there around you know, dairy and carbs, and you can summarize a lot of this with that. These are the same categories now for natural products, and look at this. It's, it's actually not necessarily dietary trend related, because some of these same categories are actually growing, and growing more than they're shrinking, like bread and baked goods. Um, these are the fastest growing categories within natural products. What's interesting here, too, is if you remember two slides ago, 
these growth numbers are bigger in total than the declines of the conventional grocery products. The percentages are also larger here too. It's, it's beverages and snacks, shelf stable functional beverages, SS is shelf stable for everybody. Um, snacks of course, natural pet is going mainstream in grocery stores this is really really an important trend it was a fairly sleepy category before in mainstream. One of the surprises was candy and I actually flipped through the category I, I didn't see any trend within there just looking at who's growing and who's not. Um, but it was interesting. Definitely walk down memory lane to look through the candy category. These are the same categories that are growing natural now looking at conventional and this is a little bit up and down but I think you can see protein obviously is big and that doesn't surprise me um, as well as snacks. So stepping back and looking at this kind of at a whole and thinking about Carlotta's growth slide there I wanted to take a look at when you actually look at the growth in conventional and you line it up against the growth in natural over time you know what are the trends and what's really interesting is is you can see over time that natural is now you know contributing all of the growth in food. Conventional is actually declining a little bit and particularly over the last three years. Um, and actually if you look over these last nine years and you add all this up there is a very immaterial difference between the numbers. Um, so going forward this obviously you know projecting forward sounds very encouraging. But one thing that was more encouraging is in, in our business I always get asked the question so what happens during the next recession? You know is this a bubble? Are valuations crazy? You know when does when do things kind of slow down? And I was actually flying out on the plane and I was trying to think about that and I was looking at this conventional growth data and trying to make sense of why it was so high and now why it's so low and kind of what was behind that. Um, and then I pulled up uh, the US personal income over time and I was you know how much personal income everybody in the US makes in total and what was really interesting to me is the personal income was inversely related to the conventional grocery. So in other words in 2007 all the way to 12 US personal income shr shrunk and conventional grocery was very high in growth. When conventional when personal income rose in 13 it dropped when it dropped in 14 it came up and then it accelerated wildly from 15 and on and that's when we got to here. So how does that answer the question about what happens in the next recession? Well I, I can't tell you what's going to happen in the next recession um, because nobody can. But if you look at the natural products every single year even with the wild swings in conventional and the wild swings in US personal income over the last nine years there hasn't been that much change in dollar growth. And what that tells me is that people aren't buying natural products. They're not coming into the sector because they got a raise or they're not leaving the sector because they got laid off. They're moving in here for health reasons and other reasons that are not financial. And I think that's really encouraging when you think about what might happen in a recession in the future and you know what's going to happen trend wise for all the people who are starting companies and trying to grow them in the sector. <coughs> um, digging in a little bit the natural channel is a channel that is really really important. I mean obviously people are growing companies you're starting new there's a lot of founders in the room I'm sure. Natural is a great place to start. People start on Amazon. This is the essentially the very strictly natural set of grocery products on spins and showing the dollars per unit per store per week in a natural store in total versus in a Mula, which is basically conventional mass drug. So you can see the volume if you get if you go and you aren't in any stores and you walk in and go into a natural store statistically you're going to get about three times the volume than if you go to a Kroger or a Safeway is your first store. <clears throat> um, and the trend is growing which I think is really important. So the natural channel even though it's much smaller than conventional it works and it's still really really important in your growth plan for your product. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more later on about why. Um, so then kind of thinking about conventional channels I wanted to take a look at kind of what's going on with natural products in conventional. And there's no this is kind of an arbitrary bucketing but I thought I'd break it down into one to five million in size and this is this is revenue within the channel this isn't company size revenue but the two probably aren't that much off. Five to twenty million in Mulo larger products and then twenty to hundred and those are you know things that are um, you know taking off and approaching the point where they're going to probably get sold to a big strategic. And you can see that there's growth actually in all levels which is encouraging. But it looks like you know the the um, that, that the retailers are embracing the small brands and it looks like they're kind of small in total. Now one thing that I've thought about over time is that 
you know, as people have personalized diets and as they get more information from, you know, online and they go out and seek this proactively because they're entering on their health basis, um, they're, they're going to, there should be more small brands in the market. And when you go and you look at the actual number of brands, not the dollar value, but the actual number of brands, natural brands in conventional here in Mulo, the actual number of brands between one and five million grew in the last two years by more than five to 100 million. So all of the smaller brands, the really small ones, comprised more growth than brands turning five to 100 million, which I thought was really interesting, considering that a retailer you know, category manager lives by their P&L, which is dollars per inch. So how are these brands turning compared to the others? If you actually look at the world on a dollar per TDB basis, and for all the you know, founders and people in the room, I think you probably think about how many units per store, per SKU, per week am I selling? That's your velocity trend. But when you look in spins and, and other data and you look at category velocity, there's a stat called TDP. And you can, you, the numbers really aren't that relevant here, but the trends within them are. And you can see here that the smaller brands have a slower turn. And, and as you get, your brand gets larger, makes sense, you're going to turn more, you're going to turn faster. Um, you're better known, you know, you're in more retailers, and, and that makes sense. <clears throat> um, but I was trying to figure out why is there kind of flatness here in the three, tr three years, and why is there a decline when you look at the larger ones? Because that, that didn't make much sense. Until we, I dug in and I said, okay, if I try to figure out what are the fastest growing categories, um, and, I, and I bucket that by $300 million or higher in Mulo, and you have to grow at least 25% over the last two years, then there's only five. And shelf-stable baby food, bath salts and fragrance, uh, refrigerated coffee that's ready to drink, refrigerated kombucha, fermented beverages, and shelf-stable sparkling water. And when you look at these five, four out of the five had declining velocity. Now these are the five fastest growing brand products, categories, over 300 million in Mulo. It didn't make sense. In fact, one of the reasons why I tuned into this was I noticed in the last 12 weeks, kombucha was off 15%. And you say that to people in the category growing at 30 or 40%, they look at you like you're nuts. Um, the reason is, is retailers are embracing, conventional retailers are embracing these hot categories and these hot trends and they're actually getting ahead of these trends by adding up more slots faster than the categories are growing. And that's really good news for everybody here who's trying to grow a company and worried about, hey, is there going to be a retail slot for me? If my category is doing well, you know, am I going to be able to get in there? Um, is, you know, is it going to be fiercely competitive? Um, and it's just, it's, it's just really good to see that. So um, that's it. Great. <laughs> so we're gonna we're gonna have our panel discussion now, and I would love to have my panelists come up and um, join us on the stage. And as they're coming up, Nick, I really appreciated what you were sharing about, um, and it was great to hear the story about how you were looking at the data and kind of discovered this on the plane, and you were so excited about. Um, how our, the natural industry is so less impacted by <clears throat> you know, economic downturns and, and consumer behavior is less connected to you know, swings that can happen at a personal level with income. Do you have any more <clears throat> insights on that in terms of how we should be thinking about that as an industry? You can grab a seat. What's that? <laughs> Um, you know, one thing, if I kind of think back to the last recession, um, which was a long time ago, you know, one thing I remember back then is we didn't have kind of such broad white space as we do today, and we didn't have, you know, all of, and things were a little bit simpler. You know, the organic version of something that's conventional could be, you know, an easier viable product. And today there's, you know, there's so much diversity with all the things you mentioned, CBD and everything else. The opportunity set is much larger. But when I look back, I think the products that got hurt the most were those that had the largest premium to the conventional product at the time. And you know, I, I think there's always a role for a product with a high premium, and that's great for retailers because it means it's a bigger ring in the same spot. Um, but you have to be able to have the value proposition to back the premium if you're going to survive a downturn. Sure, makes sense. And what it says to me is the staying power of 
health and wellness once a consumer um, has, has really started investing in their health and investing in perhaps more sustainable products, they're not likely to go back That's right. to a different way of living because they've experienced the benefits. So right. that, that says a lot for our industry, I think. Well, thank you for joining me up sta on stage. We're now going to have a discussion really turning our attention to the future of the industry. And I'm really pleased to have joining us today, we've got our industry pioneer. So Walter Robb, who is the former co-CEO of Whole Foods Market and now um, running Stonewall Robb, doing a lot of work in the industry as an investor, a mentor, an advisor, um, and really a change maker. So thank you for joining us. We also have our entrepreneurial rising star and nutrition maven here in Caitlin Smith, who is the founder and CEO of Simple Mills, which is a fast growing natural baking mix, cracker and cookie company that is really working to change the way um, America and the world eats by making everyday foods healthier with nutrient dense ingredients. And, Thank and you for joining us. Good, yeah. And they are so <laughs> delicious. And that's why you're, I think that's a big reason why you're doing so well in the marketplace. <laughs> and we're gonna talk about, we're gonna talk about that. We've also got, um, you know, a master industry collaborator in Lara Dickinson, who is the executive director of OSC Squared. If you were here at Climate Day, you know the, the really important role she's played with, with launching and growing the Climate Collaborative. And, you know, working in lots of other areas around um, more sustainable packaging, working on a new justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion initiative called the JEDI Project. So Lara knows how to collaborate, and that's gonna be a big theme for our panel. And we also have an, um, an agricultural visionary and change maker in Phil Taylor, who is the co-founder of Mad Agriculture, and someone that I've been paying a lot of attention to in Colorado as I see him convene farmers and find creative ways to help farmers transition to regenerative agriculture and help brands um, figure out how to create more regenerative supply chains for their company. So Phil is someone who is on the ground um, creating some of the changes we're gonna talk about today. And as we dig into this conversation, you know, I wanna look at the challenges and ap opportunities that we as an industry face through the lens of collaboration because I believe that finding new ways and, and possibly even radical ways to, to collaborate um, and, and work together in this industry it will really be the secret ingredient to our industries um, and really the world's ability to create solutions to some of our biggest problems and really be able to seize the big opportunities that we face as a planet. These are things that I don't think we can do working in isolation, so how do we find new ways to work together to do that? And so starting off, I wanted to just see if each of you would share um, a little bit more in the work that you're doing in the industry. If you have an example of where collaboration really enabled you to achieve something that you don't think you would have been able to do on your own. And so Walter, maybe we'll start with you. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. First of all, I think collaboration, radical collaboration, is, um, I think it's, uh, it starts with the idea of situating your business as having a larger view of your business and multiple stakeholders, not just your return, your shareholders. And you're situated in your communities with your team members, customers, and you're thinking about your business through a much broader lens. And you might think about there's already a number of companies that are cooperating with one another to share ingredients or supply chains, that sort of thing. But in the future, you could imagine uh, com you actually collaborating with competitors mm -hmm. because we're already seeing this in the tech industry. We see it in upstream and agriculture where, for example, Cargill and, and Tyson work together on various projects where you can, so you can see. And why? Because it allows you to go faster. Because if you limit yourself just to the, what's sort of inside your four walls, you're not going to pick up the sort of speed that's necessary to compete today. So think about it as a true a strategic way of thinking about business. But the story I would share with you um, is really the one that's closest to my heart. And some of you have heard this is in Detroit where we went to build the first supermarket in the inner city of Detroit in the, uh, since the 50s. And to do that, we really had to look at the business through the lens of the community stakeholder and to understand and make the decisions based on where we we're gonna situate, who we we're gonna hire, um, for example, that led to uh, take, you know, b taking the box out of the application if you'd been a felon. Uh, we took our customers, uh, potential customers out to the stores in, in suburban Detroit to get them to help us say what they liked about the store layout, the price points, the, uh, 
end caps and so forth, gave us some guidance there. We had the community guide us on uh, a number of, of our construction choices. And I think it was the involvement of all the various stakeholders in the success of that allowed it to open successfully. And so I, I realized through that experience the power of collaborating with multiple people that have an interest in the success of your business to get the benefit of their perspectives. It allows you to move more holistically, uh, more in sequence and together with your, with your various constituents and to have a better result. Great example. Caitlin. Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, I think that our, our story is similar in a lot of ways. Uh, so I started Simple Mills about six years ago. Uh, at the time, I was working a job that required a lot of travel. So I was eating a lot of processed food and a lot of sugar. And I really didn't feel great. Uh, I didn't feel like myself. And one of my friends suggested that I clean up my diet to see if that would help. And so I did. I took out a lot of the processed food. And when I did, just everything changed. I was really shocked by the impact that food has on my body. I realized that it affects both our mental and physical wellness. And when I realized that, I became determined to change the way that our country's eating and what we're eating. And so I went home one day and I brainstormed probably 10 different ways that I could help change what people are eating. Uh, everything from getting my master's in public health to starting a natural food company. Uh, and we know what I did, started a natural food company. Uh, and Simple Mills was born. And really with this idea of taking um, everyday favorites, crackers, baking mixes, cookies, and making them out of simple whole food ingredients, things that are not only uh, free from allergens and additives and, um, and gums, uh, but also for more, with more nutrient density. Uh, today, the company is so much larger. Five years ago, we were a tabletop at this show, um, very first Expo West five years ago. Uh, and today we're in 16,000 stores. We're the largest natural baking mix brand, second largest natural cracker brand, third largest natural cookie brand. Uh, but this is really a story of so many people who have collaborated with us in this industry. I have so many stories of contract manufacturers who go the extra mile to work with us to not put gums in products, or ingredient suppliers who work with us to take out the additives and the things that help them, the processing aids that help them create the ingredients so that we can have truly clean ingredients. Um, or retailers who are expanding their natural food sets or retailers who are adding dietitians to their staff to help consumers eat better. So these are all of these people in this industry who have really enabled this natural food movement. Such a good story about what you've done at Simple Mills and I love the all of the opportunity that brands have to collaborate with retailers. That's a great example. So Nick, what is your collaboration story? Um, I think the thing that I'm starting to see, and it really began a few years ago as the investor set in the industry grew, is mm -hmm. the earlier stage investors, those that are funding you know, companies with checks less than $5 million, um, there's more and more of them, and they're beginning to collaborate more together. It's not a competitive dynamic. And you know, look, the finance world is full of competition, which is the opposite of collaboration. Um, but you're seeing, because as companies grow, they need more and more money to get larger and larger to get to an exit. So all of these investors know that it's pretty unlikely that they're going to be the last check in. They're going to have to kind of pool their resources and, and do what they can to get the company to go as far as possible on the money that's going in so that they can get a larger investor to come in and be attractive to them at a good value and not get diluted too much and get to an ultimate exit. That's how they're going to make their money. Um, it's actually something that classically in venture capital you see in technology and biotech. And you see it there because nobody kind of knows the answer. You have a new drug and you've got H, you know, eight MDs that all have their theory on how it's working and why. And you need, you need that kind of brain power to be successful. The more the better. Um, so it's really encouraging to me to see, particularly as, you know, to Caitlin's point, self-awareness is really becoming big and that's, you know, driving people to seek out and experiment and this creates new categories. You know, it, people don't know the answer of how a category is going to grow and it is more difficult. And the other thing I would say too is, on the competition point, I hear a lot from companies that, you know, oh, this other person's in my category and, you know, they did this, they're getting me on Amazon keywords and there's a competitive dynamic. And you know, I think one point is, is that 
especially with the new category, your real competition in many ways is educating the customer. And it's not somebody else out there. And if you're going to pitch your company to an investor and you're the only one that's walked in with the idea that this is a category, that's a very vulnerable and lonely place. But if somebody else has done it and they've gotten funding or they're selling you know, product that you can see in spins and you can see their data, that helps you get funded by the investor. Um, mm -hmm. That's a good, good example about in, in collaboration can increase the brain power, which that's probably one of the things I love most about collaboration. Now, Lara, you could probably talk for the rest of our time about collaboration because this is what you do every day. But what's, what's that one powerful example that shows you what we can do when we think about collaboration, and even in radical ways? Well, I, I can't not talk about Climate Day yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, this room, while it was almost as full yesterday on a Tuesday to come and talk about climate change as it was today. On a Tuesday, I told Carlotta, I, I don't think anyone's gonna show up on a Wednesday three years ago when we launched and they did. And yesterday, it was packed on a Tuesday. Um, I kept telling everybody, CBD Summit is across the hall. And <laughs> they stayed, I mean, they stayed. They stayed the whole day. So um, what was really thrilling is we set out with the Climate Collaborative to change the narrative from one of, of fear and blame when three years ago, no one really wanted to talk about it, and that was what was bothering us, to hope and action. Mm -hmm. And that's what, um, that's what collaboration is really about. And um, at OSC, just backing up a few years to give you sort of the, ess the essence of OSC is collaboration. That's why we were born. Um, we gathered um, in the summer of 2012, seven CEOs of natural products companies around my dining room because we wanted to figure out if we have this shared vision, which is for a more regenerative business and more regenerative products and more regenerative agricultural solutions, could we share the work? And that's really the genesis of OSC. How do we share the work when we all have a bigger vision that we share? And so um, OSC Squared stands for One Step Closer to an Organic Sustainable Community. Um, in working on this for the past six years, I realized it's not one step, it's like 300 steps every day because I'm seeing it all over the industry. Um, we're even seeing little collaborations right now that are grassroots propping up that I'm so excited about, like um, Rebel is launching a um, new mate that has um, a, a Moringa Kuli Kuli in it. And um, Dr. Bronner's is oh, constantly opening up their supply chain and coconut to other brands who need it and they, can, they know they can trust and source in a sustainable way. So we're seeing all these grassroots efforts and what we really want to do is also bring this together and have a leveraged impact on behalf of the whole industry. So Climate Collaborative was born um, from about three years ago, uh, I think it was September 2012, a group of, uh, of OSC, we get together every month as CEOs and talk about things, and this time we invited a group of scientists in to talk about climate change in our supply chain. And I shared about this a little bit about this yesterday, so I'll just briefly um, share that we walked away from that meeting feeling totally deflated. Usually we feel great. High fives, great meeting, we're all helping each other. We felt terrible. But when you have that feeling of something wrong in your gut, it prompts you mm -hmm. to move forward. And what we realized is we didn't know how to respond to the idea of glacial melting and radiative forcing in our supply chains. And so then we, um, my co-founder of the Climate Collaborative, Jessica Rolfe, who is a, uh, a founding partner at Happy Family, called me and we realized, you know what? We, there's got to be a way we can connect the dots and make it relevant for the natural products industry. Um, we are the most action-oriented group, and we, when we get together and believe in something, there is no industry that works better. Um, mm -hmm. But we haven't created the path to action. And so we started to develop a path to action through talking to the industry, surveying the industry, understanding the barriers. And that is what the Climate Collaborative is all about creating a path to action that's not scary or bad, but actually hopeful and helpful, and looking at long-term, um, looking at the long-term view, which, you know, climate change, you can't just look at, okay, what am I doing tomorrow? You have to think at a systems level. It requires some bravery, and it requires courage, and it's a lot easier when you're in it together, when you're all supporting each other towards a long-term view. 
Well, I'm very grateful that you're doing this work around climate and all of the other issues, and thanks for that example. So Phil, last but not least, tell us as, about how you think about collaboration from an agricultural perspective and what's happening with farmers. So I think of collaboration as community. Mm -hmm. You know, we're social beings and we need each other. Mm -hmm. And for me, until we fully embody the virtues and principles of what drives good human economy into the financial economy that drives these conversations, we will never achieve the world that we wish to, to achieve. And so we have to build in the virtues of good community, collaboration, love, respect, and work. And I think a lot of the, I, I know much more about the farmer mentality of collaboration, which is very high. They're very happy to look across fence lines and say, hey, here's what I'm doing. I'm going to share with you. They run cooperatives. They don't have that kind of elbowy competition thing that I think comes more with a scarcity mentality. There's a sense of we're in this together. We go to church together. You know, my son's the quarterback. Your son's the wide receiver. You know, they have that level of embeddedness, place, situatedness, and belonging that I think in the brand space we're, we're moving much more frenetically. And it's heated up and there's competition, there's market space. And so there's a whole sort of cultural collaboration and community that comes with farmers that I find would be wonderful to percolate into this community more. But at that, that said, there's all kinds of, I think, great trends and feelings and energy around regenerative ag. Everyone's extremely open in that space around sharing what's working, what's not. Um, how we fit together in the movement. So I'm excited about seeing how that newfound sense of community um, and collaboration kind of awakens in, in this space. Carla, I, could I add one thing? Yeah, of course. Just one is for, for those of you that are, are younger, that this industry really was built on collaboration. I mean, mm -hmm. this industry started out being fringe, and so it was a matter of holding together as a tribe and coming out. But the organic standards, for example, came as a result of a lot of people in this room, Mark Retzloff, others, a green, bringing people together to put a standard, put a stake in the ground, and to just keep going. And, and the second point I would make is that collaboration can be serving uh, not just for profit, but for nonprofit. And one example of that is right now, I'm working in Pueblo, Colorado, and Carlotta is involved as well as Mark. And this idea that we could take food and make it a driver of community building and also um, economy building, that the, the food system itself can make that to happen for greater community welfare. So this idea that you can take the collaboration, even radical collaboration, people coming together that you might not sit with or work with, to advance something that makes a better world, to Phil's point, not just for profit. It sits alongside it just fine, but this idea you can do something for greater using the technique of collaboration, the power of collaboration, it really is a game changer. It's deeply fulfilling yeah. on a human level. Deeply we'll say fulfilling. That. Yes, and, and I, I love that you brought up the example that that's really was at the genesis of the creation of this industry. And I think this industry was created from the understanding that we're all connected and that what happens to the farmer is happening to me and what's happening to the planet is happening to me. And, and by embracing that kind of a viewpoint, we have the ability to really find new ways, creative ways to work together that can create very healthy financial businesses, but also make sure that we're taking care of one another and the planet. And so I wanted to talk about some of the big areas where we have huge challenges and we also have huge opportunities. And one of those is related to um, education around health and nutrition. You know, as, as I was sharing and as we see in the stats, consumer, changing consumer beliefs and desires and behaviors are really what are gro is growing this industry. And so more and more consumers are waking up to the importance of what they put in their bodies and on their bodies and in their homes, as we talked about. But I think more than ever, consumers are confused. Mm -hmm. There's so much information and also a lack of information. And, and it's creating this confusion that can feel like whiplash for consumers. And Caitlin, I know this is something that's really deeply important to you as you look um, at how you're growing Simple Mills. And I'm just wondering, um, you know, how can we as an industry work together um, to address this confusion problem and really bring much better education to the consumer. Yeah, I, the consumer absolutely is um, being hit with so much conflicting information. I think it's over half of consumers now doubt their food choices because of that conflicting information. Uh, and I think it's on all of us in this industry to help simplify the answers for them. 
Uh, as you can imagine, complexity is a little bit of our nemesis at Simple Mills. Uh, <laughs> so much so that we actually have a mat in our doorway that says complexity on it. We like walk over and stomp on every day and uh, it's really beat up after this last Chicago winter. <laughs> but, uh, but I think for us as a brand, there's, there's several things that we think about. Um, the first thing is really distilling simplicity in every way that we can. Um, and this is something that we can all do across this industry. So distilling our messaging, um, the things that we're communicating on our packages, um, our ingredient lists, um, even our approach to nutrition. There's a lot of things that we know and are well established as facts um, that you know, the shorter the ingredient list, the better. Um, less sugar is better than more. Natural is better than, uh, than all of these uh, added ingredients. Um, and, and so really relying on those. But that doesn't keep us as an industry from uh, confronting the difficult issues, which is something that we also need to be doing. Uh, for us as a brand, uh, what we do is there are a lot of shades of gray when it comes to nutrition. And so for those, we actually commission uh, nutrition research to take a look at both sides uh, and really make a decision for ourselves and have healthy internal debates about what direction we should be going. And this creates much more timeless perspectives on nutrition um, and also helps the, the consumer really trust um, what they're getting on the shelf. I think it's also really hard to talk about this topic without talking about us being truthful and transparent with the consumer uh, and not putting lipstick on pigs. Uh, I think it's on all of us to make sure that we're not misleading consumers and making sure that we're being honest about our products. And then finally, really helping that consumer along. Uh, so for us, we spend a lot of our communications on, uh, on helping the consumer figure out um, what they should be doing to lead a healthy life. We partner with doctors, dietitians, uh, nutritionists, influencers who are all working to clear up um, what's actually good for people. And we also partner a lot with other brands who believe the same things that we do. Because we believe that kind of all of us working together, these brands, these um, dietitians, nutritionists, um, we are all stronger together than we are individually. Great. And you know, Walter, I know um, from your many years in retail that you, you were working to address this consumer confusion problem. And, you know, what are the, some of the, the best new ideas or technologies or ways that you see us as an industry being able to bring better information to yeah. the consumer? Well, I think I saw some numbers just, there's a group called the International Food Council, which I never heard of before. Mm -hmm. They actually say that 80% of customers are confused with the information. In other words, my experience is people are so overloaded and overwhelmed with choices and information. And look, just look at what you presented this morning. I mean, there's a lot of stuff in there that is, how, how do you make sense of it and fit it into some sort of direction? And besides that, we're not just a natural food group now. We've kind of gone into these food tribes, of which there are you know, many food tribes, keto, paleo, whatever, whatever tribe you belong to. Uh, people have become really strong zealots about their particular take on nutrition. And, and also, Daniel Gould at Food and Tech Connect pointed this out to me. At the present time, we're getting 75% of our food from 12 plants and five animals. So we've got this frontier ahead of us with all new sorts of ingredients and materials, which suggests that, and it's the right thing to do, that a lot more push is gonna come into new choices coming into the marketplace. At the same time, if you read the New York Times uh, last Sunday, there was a great piece in there. They put a computer on the ideal diet answer is, which I think everybody knows in the end, there is no one perfect diet for any one individual. That in fact, it's customized and science is taking us there with, with, the, with the microbiome, personalized medicine, which is also going upstream into the family, precision agriculture, precision farming. So we're moving into a future where, we're gonna move to a future where I could see the customer getting a much better understanding of their own individual health situation. Technology is going to take us there. And maybe that's going to drive backward in terms of some of the food choices. We could see a customer that's going to be set up to actually personalize the food products uh, against their personal situation. But I think we're in a situation where there's an overload of information. Yes, we have a lot of new technology coming. The, the apps that are being developed uh, by Whole Foods and by others to help you understand nutritional panels and get information in real time when you're shopping, whether you're scanning a label, opening your app, getting push notifications, or whether you're shopping online, all that information is gonna to continue to be available. The question is, 
How are you going to assemble that in some sort of go for it for yourself? I mean, there are basic rules, right? Eat whole foods, I mean, with a small w. Uh, you know, plant-based foods. These seem to be generally vegetables, high nutritional density. You can't go wrong with that. There's some basic fundamental things that, you know, that our industry is based on, I think, are correct. But I think this is going to be very complex, and I'm not sure I see right now a clear answer to the question of how to help people, other than what Caitlin said, which is, we got to get rid of the, if you, can't, if you can't be transparent about what you're doing, if you're not being honest about the ingredients that you're choosing, the, where you're sourcing them, how you're producing them, get real with that, because if you're not, somebody's going to figure it out. And that's not helping our overall situation to make the case that food that's prepared in a whole food in a small w, again, prepared that way, is healthier for you and for your communities and for the planet. So I think everybody's commitment to getting real around where they're sourcing it, how they're making it, how they're presenting it, what they're claiming about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's going to be, we have a big part to play in reducing the sort of confusion that's out there as we move towards a much more personalized future, which I think is, opens the world to a whole new rule of innovation uh, for, for everyone from farmers all the way to the brands. I agree. I think, I think so much is about transparency. And it is interesting um, and, and hopeful to see some of the collaboration that's happening to enable greater transparency in the industry. That's something that we've been talking a lot about. But so, Carla, just one last thing is think about this indoor food, right, which is on the table right now with the standards at the uh, okay. center. There are no clear standards for that. And there's, th this is something the industry historically has done to, to step in and try to create a framework for people to understand. But there's aeroponics you know, hydroponics, there's soilponics, there's what, there's all this indoor food, there's cell-based food that you mentioned this morning. First of all, what are the standards for that so people can say, I can trust how this is being produced? We've done that before, we should do it again, right? And then also, what is the customer gonna say about that? Is the customer gonna be okay with buying 100% indoor produced food? In Sweden, for example, 80% of the food produced indoors, that's where they live. But how will our customers respond to this these changing choices in food that you put up on this morning, and how will we help them to understand that? Those are questions that we have to solve. Yeah, absolutely, and standards are the key to that. Um, Nick, is there anything you would add to this conversation? Um, you know, you were talking about how important the natural channel is from a velocity standpoint for brands, but any thoughts about how, in particular, natural retailers can address this consumer confusion question? Um, Great question. So I think in thinking about um, some of what Walter was just saying about confusion and information overload, um, and also kind of the community aspect, I feel like natural retailers have an advantage in some ways, and one of the reasons they sell you know, newer products so well is that they've got such passionate employees that are really, really dialed into trends, and they've got kind of a knowledge base there. Um, and to the extent that they can increase the personalization of the experience, I think that, you know, face-to-face -face, um, and, you know, help the customer education process, I think that helps a lot. And, you know, just, just in our work, uh, I see it sometimes just with people when they found a company very early and they go demo their product and they're obviously giving perfect information because they're the founder and, you know, they've got the perfect passion. And, you know, they'll go and they'll run a price reduction and every store will be up 10% afterward, but the ones that they demo at will be up, you know, two or three X. I mean, there's literally a company in Boston that was just in Whole Foods Boston that did that. And then, you know, you get bigger and it gets harder. Um, so that, that personalization is big. The, you know, when you kind of scale it up, one example that I've seen recently is in an independent natural retailer, um, there was a company who collaborated and partnered with a retailer to create a little food service um, kind of, you know, production in there where people could go and they could get lunch and, and basically products that that company sold as well as some other ones. And, you know, there was obviously some kind of a financial partnership that had to be behind that. But it really promoted that company's products because they were, you know, they're front and center of the lunch counter and what people are eating in the best form that the company would intend the products to be. Mm, that's a great example. So we're going to switch gears and talk about supply chain because just like we have with, with all of this information and some take times lack of information for the consumer, we also face a lot of supply um, chain challenges. And, you know, Phil, you work with farmers all over the country to help connect them with new opportunities um, in the changing food market. And you also help brands, as I was mentioning, uh, regenerate their supply chains. And, what are some of the biggest barriers you face in this work, and do you have any examples of success that point to how we will 
how we can create a more regenerative food system um, that nourishes a growing world while healing the planet. Yeah. Um, so the, what's interesting is that the natural organic foods industry and economy looks really strong and healthy and has a great trajectory. Meanwhile, the farm economy is totally struggling. Bankruptcies, um, net income is lowest since 1983. Suicide rates are the highest since 83 as well. It's a very dire situation. And so the energy here is totally different than what we would find on the, on the plains or in, in the rural parts of America. And so there's actually a great opportunity in that to link brands that are trying to change the world and have impact um, here to that, that struggle. And spending a lot of time with, with farmers that live you know, often in the middle of nowhere, they really struggle with how to connect to those brands. And so there's, there's a variety, there's three big barriers that we find. One is just know-how. How do you get off of the agro-industrial superhighway onto the country road again? Like what is, what is that map? You know, from not growing just corn and beans, you know, and being, you know, um, against commodity prices. And so Mad Ag does a lot of work, and there's a lot of other great organizations here that help guide that process. So some of it's know-how. Um, the second is capital. You know, they have very, very little uh, capital to work with, mm -hmm. a lot of volume, raised within margins, saddled up to debt. So what are the new kinds of capital that can come in and help de-risk and ease the burden of trying something different? and particularly diversifying what they grow. I think diversity from a human health perspective is gonna be really hot in the future for great reasons. And as we see farmers stacking enterprises and diversifying, it also creates ecological and economic resilience. And so that's a really uh, powerful principle of diversity that we can see both in the market here and on the farm. Um, Jubilee, as Jubilee Partners um, Replant Fund is one awesome thing that's coming up everyone should look into. It's basically mobilizing donor advised ca capital. $110 billion is on, sitting on the sidelines. And they're looking to mobilize that at like two to three percent interest loans to farmers to help with infrastructure and regenerative practices. So there's some really cool capital. The third um, yeah, cool. barrier is access to markets. And I think this is where brands can play a really big role by directly connecting to the farmer. You know, as a brand, it's your responsibility to ensure that your supply chain is enriching the earth and its community that produces it and not destroying it. It's a basic human responsibility. And I think when we're blind to our supply chains, we don't know if they're destroying the world or healing it. And so it's on you, it's probably low on your priority list, but going all the way back down to the soil and making sure that what you're sourcing is providing a healing mechanism to that. And organic is not enough. Um, right now, the, the prairie and the plains are being broken, you know, to grow organic crops um, using old tillage practices. You know, it's a fight against nature. And so there's a, there's a sort of the original organic, the regenerative organic is now sort of coming into full swing. And that's really working with nature um, to take the next step in uh, creating delicious food, nutrient dense. It also leaves the, the world in a better state than when you found it. Again, basic human principles, love your neighbor as yourself, leave the world better than you found it. These are the things that are embodied in the regenerative movement. And I think it's a way that rural America is gonna wake up again. And because consumerism evolves here in this room and the power of brand to meet that consumer, there's a, an immense amount of responsibility and power for everyone in this room to find those farmers and help them flow some of that money back down to the soil heal that economy as well as the land at the same time. So I could go on, but I'll resist. But that, I think that gives us a lot to think about. And, and hopefully a lot of the brands will really take those kinds of ideas to heart as they think about their own supply chains. And Walter, I wanted to just give you an opportunity to weigh in on this question because, you know, in your work with S2G Ventures and, you know, a lot of the work you do directly with farmers and brands, how would you like to see farmers and brands work together more closely to address some of what Phil talked about? Yeah. Well, shout out to the S2G team that's back there, uh, all of them. Uh, they're an extraordinary uh, fun, really with very value-centered investing, kind of what Phil spoke about earlier. But I think, A, that the, the idea of farmers are not appreciated in this country. They, they will tell you that. They, they feel uh, unseen and unappreciated. They are trying to get off the superhighway, and their only way to do that is to, is to hook up with brands that they can then. I'd love to see the brands and the farmers actually come to market together in some way. They are looking for a way forward, and they're looking a way to, they're willing to diversify their crops if you can give them a way to market. 
They don't understand how to go directly to the markets. That's not in their toolkit. So this idea of partnering in new ways, collaborating in new ways where, for example, you could highlight the farmers that are doing your grain uh, or develop a particular type of grain for you, I think would be a, an excellent example of how to do that. So I don't know. I think you've got S2G is working on a project with a large CPG and the power of the collaboration they're allowing uh, this particular CPG is I don't know if I'm allowed to say it or not, is, is taking the offtake from this conversion of land. So it's, it's 10,000 acres. It's a large block of land that's been converted uh, to more sustainable agriculture, and the offtake's been taken by this company in order to be able to give the farmers access to the market. The second thing is this, this uh, conversion to organic is very difficult. Most farmers will tell you they lose money in the three-year transition to do this. It's very rigorous. We need some new mechanisms to really be able to allow them to, to make those sorts of changes. And so, how could we either collectively or the individual brands support the farmers in making that transition to more sustainable practice? There's a in the interest of time, there's a couple of ideas. Yeah, those are great kind ideas. It goes back to your collaboration theme, though. Mm -hmm. If we're gonna if we're gonna work on these big things, we've got to work on them together. Yeah. Pipeline Foods set of Minnesota is an incredible yes. example of de-risking that transition to organic, really enabling that that supply. Look them up. Agreed. We have a session, I wish I had the time written down, but we have a session later this week that's very specifically about how brands and farmers can work more closely together. I think you're on that, in that session, Phil. So, so lots more to talk about on there, that. There is another company, Growers Edge, that STG is involved with. It's actually helping the farmers de-risk the, uh, when they make that switch to new technology or yields, they get insurance premiums that protect them, which current insurance markets just don't function that way. So whether it's Pipeline Foods or Growers Edge, we need to kind of build this infrastructure like the conventional ag world has. Brands can help that to make that happen. Absolutely. Grower's Edge. Grower's Edge. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So we're going to switch gears one more time in our last few minutes and talk about another big challenge and opportunity we have, and that's around packaging. This is a consumer packaged goods industry. This is a consumer packaged goods um, show. And you know we know that the packaging of our industry is having a huge impact on our environment and on the climate. And you know that was a big focus of Climate um, Day yesterday. And so, Lara, will you talk about the? I, I want everyone to know about what you're doing with the Compostable Packaging Coalition and how industry is working um, together, even competitors working together to address this huge challenge and then create more opportunity for for the whole. Yeah. Thank you. Well, the OSC Squared Packaging Collaborative was born from a, a deep need around business integrity. Um, when we all got together as CEOs, we, uh, we now have 30 or 35 that work really deeply together. Um, but the first thing we identified that we wanted to work on on behalf of the industry was packaging. It was always packaging, packaging, packaging. I have this high integrity organic food. I work so hard to source, yet my package goes straight to landfill or the oceans. It doesn't match. It doesn't add up. And it's also where consumers complain the most, so we feel it. Um, so we got together um, at Expo West about six years ago. We invited you know, maybe 15 people to say, let's you know, come and talk about packaging with us um, and at a Marriott Hotel Suite. And people started filing in. I you know, ceremoniously put down my plate of a dozen muffins. And literally, I looked around, and as I kept watching people finally, we had like 90 people in the room. It just like the word got out, and the whole foods team was there. Everybody was there. And I was, I was kind of freaking out, because it was a very different you know, expectation in terms of like, wow, there's something really big here we've got to do. <laughs> people that really care. And it was, the energy was very high in the room. And the great news was that we invited a number of packaging companies into that room. And suddenly, we had a lot of brands in the room saying, I need a better package. I want something sustainable. This is not just little alter eco or little Anumi tea saying, you know, give me something better, give me something better. This is $2 billion worth of revenue in the room. And so from that point on, we started to work with these packaging um, partners, um, particularly Elk and Foodamora are deep, in a deep partnership with us to work on the technology. And they, they agreed to invest on our behalf with the promise that we would continue to give them the opportunity to showcase technology that they introduced and that we would test and learn together. And so fast forward five years later, we are still working on it. It is damn hard to compete against a 60-year-old entrenched petroleum-based plastics industry. And in the last six years, we've made a ton of progress. It was three times more expensive to introduce something that wasn't as good 
five years ago. Now we're at about the 30% more expensive and the products are starting mm -hmm. to work. Um, and so we, it, last year you might have seen Alter Eco, Numi, a few companies, Regrand are coming out with compostables. It is a test and learn and open source hard thing. And this is where it is not your competitive advantage to come out and say, look at me, I'm first and it's only for me with packaging. This is our industry imperative to say, invitation everybody, I have a package and I want to share it and, and have you all get involved because if we scale it, it gets cheaper and we can pass that along to consumers. New Barn's gonna do a great reveal later this week that we'll share. Um, and so we are, um, we're still testing and learning, but we have great brands that are working with us. Everyone from Amy's Bakery to Ben and Jerry's to Alter Eco to Lotus to Bronner's in the room working hard, Patagonia Provisions. And um, my call to action would be is if you are a bar company, if you are Cliff, if you are Mars, if you are Kellogg's, you need to get on this train because this is the one, this is the piece of the um, wrapper that works the best, that we're having the best success with, is small form wrappers. And those are the things that are going out and they're in the landfill the most. And so we are really you know, putting a challenge out there. Um, it, is, it is not um, easy. But what has been really encouraging is Jean Cloutier, who's been working with me since the start, is my packaging expert partner, first at Alter Eco and then at Elk, full time, for five years was just like, this is terrible. Everybody's calling me and I don't have anything good to give them. It's either too expensive or it doesn't work right on the machines um, or, and they won't test and invest. And in the last six months, largely because number one, Whole Foods Market named packaging, sustainable packaging, and the OSC Packaging Collaborative as one of the top 10 food trends for 2019. Two, because Europe banned 10 single-use plastics. And three, because probably at least a dozen very large CPG companies have made huge commitments to convert to recyclable and compostable. The demand has increased substantially, and we want those big CPG companies at the table to drive scale. And so not only has the demand improved, but the technology is radically improving. Um, and so what we didn't have even a year ago, we have today, and all new machines and some really exciting developments with companies testing with us. Um, so I'd invite anyone to, to, to really start addressing and open sourcing on packaging um, with either, uh, either on your own or with OSC Packaging Collaborative because this is probably the biggest pain point in our industry that we need to come together on. Yeah, it's a good call to action. Yeah. Get on that train. And that's how I'd like to end. We have just about a minute. So I'd love to give everyone up here an opportunity. If you had one call to action as people head out into and uh, this 39th Annual Expo West, what would it be? I'll start, and it's why I wore my t-shirt. Mm -hmm. Be good to people. We yeah. are connected, we are an amazing industry, and so just treat everyone that you meet this, this week with, with lots of love and respect. You never know who you're going to meet, and so, you know that person that you're standing next to in a line may be the person who really changes your business, so that's my call to action. Um, and maybe Nick will move to you. What's your call to action? Sure. Um, I think back to 14 or 15 years ago when I was at my first expo, and I think this is probably three to four times the number of people here. Um, and I think in a lot of industries, there's a tendency to think about numbers. And you look at LinkedIn, it's numbers, and it's keeping score about you know, relationships and contacts. But in this industry in particular, I think the you know, the, your actual network is measured more by the depth and authenticity of your relationships over the number. And, you know, what I would say to everybody is, you know, the more you engage in this industry, and you'll notice that, you know, the people that have been here in the industry a long time are all paying it forward. And the more you engage and pay it forward, you know, the more it's going to benefit your company, it's going to benefit your personal relationships, and even your health. That's a great call to action. Do you have another one, Laura? Um, embrace diversity. The secret to this industry is innovation. And without diversity of thought, perspective, and listening, and that indigenous knowledge that we might have forgotten um, and are starting to remember, we won't go as far. So embrace those differences all around us. I would say that regenerative agriculture is not a trend. It's a cultural revolution that reimagines how we live well on Earth. And are you in? Natural and organic are just a stepping stone to get there. In 20 years, we'll have an entirely different language to describe where we are. Yeah, that's great. Caitlin? I think that with really complex issues, it's easy for the complexity to drive inertia. 
and for all of us not to know what to do next. Uh, but I think there's better is better. If you make one change, that's enough. And I've personally seen in my own business how a rising tide raises all boats. And by all of us each making individually better decisions, it becomes table stakes in future products. So five years ago, people weren't talking as much about sugar. You take out sugar out of your product or reduce the amount of sugar, that becomes a table stake in future products. And so make those tiny changes so that the future itself is different. Great. We'll give you the yeah. last word. Thank you. Well, um, first of all, to give thanks to Carl Auden, Fred, the others from the Expo, Doug Green over the years, and have created a place for us to gather every year. This is the 39th. I've been to every single one, believe it or not. I think you have too, Mark. Uh, to see where it started with a thousand, here we now are 90,000 people. It's amazing. We're not take for granted we have this chance to get together and to thank them for that, uh, what they're doing for us. Number two is, like, in, you're only going to find your potential to look inside yourself and find out where your particular passion is in all of this. This is a big journey to a healthier world, but everybody's got places where they really resonate. I would really encourage you to figure out what that is for you. For me, it's around democratizing access. This is not just for few people. This is for all people. We know what good health means. And third, I would just leave you with my, one of my great idols growing up was a guy named Albert Schweitzer. Many of you probably never heard of him. In 1963, he won the Nobel Peace Prize. But what Albert Schweitzer said is in every moment we find ourselves, uh, the future of humanity depends on each and every one of us displaying true humanity to one another. And kind of to Phil's point is, uh, it's not just what we're doing, it's how we're doing it. And we're setting an example with the love and humanity we share with one another. So I would leave that with you. Thank you. Enjoy your expo. Be good to one another and have an amazing show. Thank you for being here. And thank our, our panel.